Um, that's one where there's there's two pulleys connected by a belt. One one pulley starts up and starts to turn the other one because of the belt around them. Now, um, it, and for a little bit, there's slipping going on, and then sh after a little bit, they don't slip. It's exactly the same kind of thing that goes on in your car when you start it up. The engine starts, starts turning the fan belt. There's always a little bit of slippage before the water pump and whatever, the, the uh, radiator fan, uh, before they get up to non-slip speed. The, the engine starts, starts pulling on the, 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 the belt, and there's a little bit of slipping. And in fact, sometimes you'll even hear that as sort of a squealing. So if, uh, say, that one's turning this way, that will cause, of course, this one to start turning that way. Uh, the way the problem's written up, one of them is already operating at full speed, they engage the belt, and it starts to bring the other one up to full speed. In doing so, one will slow down a little bit, the other will speed up a little bit, until then there's no slipping, and then they both run at whatever speeds um, is their steady state speed. So if you look at those two, let's, let's say this one's uh, running that way first, but it'll start to slow down a little bit as it tries to accelerate that one. So if you look at that bigger one, uh, it's already running this way, but it's going to accelerate that way as it starts to slow down. That's because as it's pulling on the belt for the lower one, uh, the smaller one, there's a difference in the tensions of the belt on either side of that. So I, I just labeled them A and B to call them something. So as the big wheel is pulling on the little one, that will cause more tension on the upper line than on the lower line. That serves as an imbalance in the torques, which will tend to cause the bigger one to decelerate. So if its speed is that way, its acceleration will tend to be that way as it tries to drag the little wheel up to some speed. Comfortable with that? That makes some sense. It's, it's not terribly different than when we we're looking at particle uh, velocities and accelerations. An object moving in one direction, maybe trying to tow something behind it, that something behind it will cause it to decelerate even though its velocity is forward. Look at the littler one. And it's got those same forces acting on it, because it's the same belt, but in opposite directions. So I tried to draw them bigger if they're bigger forces and smaller if they're smaller forces. So that will cause this one to have then a net acceleration in that direction because there's an imbalance in the torques. Comfortable with that? Well, you can write that uh, business for this one. Remember that the sum of the torques is going to equal the moment of inertia times the acceleration. That's the rotational equivalent of F equals MA. So you can write that for this wheel. And you can write that for that wheel too. The forces will be the same, but the torques are different because both of these, uh, these have different radii, which means the torques are different. And each has a different moment of inertia because they're different size. And they'll have different accelerations. This one, of course, is decelerating. This one is accelerating. But even, not only are the, the signs opposite, but it's very unlikely the magnitudes would be the same. 
So you can uh, set up these two equations using the forces, the moment of inertia and the like. You can combine these to, let's, uh, let's just label for useful purposes that one and two. So that's one, two, two, and this will be the sum of the torques on one, sum of the torques on two, just to keep those kind of separated. You can, you can find a ratio, something like alpha one over alpha two when you have those two. Um, from those equations, but that ratio also will equal, well, let's see, uh, alpha is delta omega over delta t. Delta T is the same for both of those, so that'll cancel. So this will be delta omega for the first one over delta omega for the second one. And are you given those omegas? I forget. No, you just want to find out when they're finally running at the same, when there's no more slipping, right? You're looking for that point. So you'll have this equation with a couple unknown omegas in it. But you can uh, eliminate the unknown omegas by using the no slip condition that it'll finally reach. When that's true, the, uh, a point right there will have the same velocity as a point right there because they're connected by the same belt when there's no slipping. So the no slip condition uh, occurs when finally V1 equals V2. That's not true when there's slipping going on. It is true when they're not slipping. Or R1 omega 1 equals R2 omega 2. And I think if I, if I remember, you have both the R's. You have, I think, the initial angular velocity of not even that. So maybe the, the answer. Or you is do it, but in terms of variables. That's oh yeah, it'll be in terms of that. So when you set all those up, it should be it should be algebra left over. Let me make sure I called one and two the same one, just so the pictures all match, and I'll I can give it to you. So the final angular velocity of the big one, the big wheel, will be the original angular speed, this omega here because this one's a, a still, stand still, over 1 plus m2 over m1. Reading that right? Yep. And the final angular velocity of the little one, the second one, will be M1 R1 over M2 R2 times that speed. It's just the ratio of the uh, uh, moments of inertia. I think that's everything in there. I want you to put all that together. Okay. But I'll have these posted overnight anyway, so you can see them. Another question or another one on that? Another question then? Okay, Joey?
This one says that uh, proton zips around the two kilometer Fermi lab particle accelerator. Uh, that's a large circular track that can keep charged particles like electrons. No, it says protons, doesn't it? Not that it matters terribly. It says protons. It can keep charged particles moving in a circle by the presence of a, a magnetic field. And you'll cover this in, in physics three. Uh, but the, the deal is as a, a charged particle is moving with certain velocity through a magnetic field, there's a force exerted on that particle perpendicular to the velocity. And we should recognize, I hope, that any time there's a force in a particular direction, there's acceleration in that direction if it's unbalanced. And if we have acceleration perpendicular to velocity, we have circular motion. So that's what's going on with the particle accelerator. The um, angular momentum, what's our symbol for angular momentum? L. L. The um, angular momentum is the momentum the uh, object in question, that in this case the proton, has with uh, respect to the center of the motion. So the momentum is mass times velocity, and it's at a distance r from the center. So the angular momentum is r and v. That works. It's the product of these when they're perpendicular, as they always are uh, with circular motion. Okay, Joey, that help? Yeah. The force equals mv? No, force doesn't equal mv. Units wouldn't work. So velocity equals mass times velocity? Velocity is not equal mass times velocity. That they're in completely different colors. This one's separated over here a little bit. This is a particle of some mass that has a velocity, therefore it has a momentum, mv. This is the momentum. What do we, we use P in this class for momentum, right? So this is the momentum. Oh, I already got a P in there for proton. This is a momentum P. And that's a momentum a certain dis distance from the center. So that's the angular momentum. It's the linear momentum uh, with a moment arm, just like we do a force with a moment arm gives us a torque. Others? Okay. Um, this last chapter that we started on last week on Wednesday, it has two parts to it. Um, the second part, uh, we're kind of running out of time, so I'd rather not introduce it and have it just cloud the issue. Um, plus, we'll get to it in great detail in a class that the engineers will take a year from now. Um, the, the elasticity of solids, the fact that as we exert forces on objects, real objects, it tends to compress them a little bit if it's a compressive force or even stretches them a little bit if it's a tensile force. And then when that force is relieved, the things return to their original size, usually, unless you've done it so far that they actually change the nature of the object changes. Either it fractures or shatters or deforms permanently, uh, or even the crystalline uh, nature of them can change and then it's a different material. Um, so. Uh, if you choose to do the optional homework, that's what OPT stands for. If you choose to do this week, this chapter's homework, chapter 14 homework as optional homework, then uh, um, you also have to do that section for it to count as part of the optional homework. But I'm not going to put it on the test for tomorrow. Just 
All we're going to look at on the only part that will be on the test tomorrow is this part that we started last Wednesday about equilibrium. And so that's what we'll look at then today some. There's only two conditions that need to be met for an object to be in equilibrium. Well, what do we mean by equilibrium in the first place? It'd be nice to know what we're even shooting for when we're shooting for equilibrium. Balance. The object static and accelerated. It's, well, it's, it's what? It's not accelerated. It's, it, those, those, all those things go together. It's balanced in that uh, whatever forces are on it, aren't enough to make it do anything than what it's just doing anyway, which is usually it's just sitting there. So the, the thing we want to be true is that acceleration is zero and angular acceleration is zero. Uh, usually that extends even a little bit farther uh, because generally the velocity is zero to start with, so if the acceleration is zero, then the velocity stays zero. And that's what we want, buildings and structures uh, and other big objects like that for the most part to do, which is stay where they are. Don't move, don't go anywhere, especially when I'm driving my car across it. So we usually have the other situation in the problem that the velocity is zero and the uh, angular velocity zero. That's not always the case. You have to look at the problem. But if we're talking about bridges and buildings and the like, yeah, they have no velocity to start with, and we want them to have no velocity to finish with. So to achieve this very important condition, what do we need to have happen? That'll take care of part of it. The forces, which of course we know, when we add up the forces, that tells us what the acceleration is. But we want the acceleration to be zero, so we want the sum of the forces then to be zero. For every left pushing force, there's got to be an equal and opposite amount of force pushing right. For every up pushing force, it's going to be an equal amount, opposite amount of down pushing force. If not, if either of those conditions or both aren't met, if there's some imbalance there, then there's going to be acceleration because that's what happens when forces are unbalanced. So we're looking for the condition where all of the forces have some counterpart, equal and opposite, pushing back by the same amount. It may not always be terrifically obvious in a problem just because the way some forces line up. We might have a force like that and a force like that and a force like that. That can be in equilibrium as long as the horizontal component of that force is equal to that one and the vertical component of that force is equal to that one. If that's the case, then even though there's three forces, if we look at the components, then we see that all the up forces are canceled, all the sideways forces are also canceled. We get a net acceleration of zero of whatever the object is. So these problems tend to be assisted by a free body diagram. So you can see what the forces are. You can even look at the diagram and see I've got a vertical force there and no way there's a horizontal, uh, another vertical force counteracting it. I must be missing something in the problem. So you know you're not done checking up on uh, making sure you've got all the forces you're supposed to. And you might as well not sum the forces until you got them all. However, this does not alone guarantee equilibrium. Or does it? Got 
to sum the torques as well. This just guarantees there's not going to be any linear acceleration. In other words, the linear velocity will remain constant. But if we've got something just, just setting on a wall and it's turning, we don't want it to have angular acceleration either. Just the fact that it's pinned to the wall will guarantee it's not going anywhere. But we also don't want it to have an angular acceleration. So we also have to sum the torques. We know that if the tor torques sum to zero, then the angular acceleration is zero. And those are our two equilibrium conditions. How many equations there for your use? Three. Are you blind? One, two. He said three. Is he right or is he wrong? And he sits up here as teacher's pet. He's right. He's, there are only three equations there, which is sufficient for the problems we do. Which is what? The problems we've been working on, where these three can equations are... Do, does everybody see why it's three equations? Two -dimensional. It's two-dimensional. We, we do two-dimensional problems. Everything that we have that does any turning turns only in a single plane. Either the plane of the board if I draw it, or the plane of your paper if you write it down. We don't have things that can turn in all three dimensions, like an object would if it could wobble. Not only rotate, but the axis of rotation could, could change shape. So this is okay. This is sufficient for our two-dimensional problems. Three equations in two-dimensional problems. If we had three-dimensional problems, we'd need the full three-dimensional version of those two equations. All right. If I remember, we started a problem on Wednesday. Did we not finish it? I don't think we did. We got, we got, we got it set up. I'll leave those there because we need those. We had uh, well, an eight meter long platform. Hinged at one end with somebody standing at the, uh, at the quarter point. So there's half, there's quarter. Somebody was right there, um, 600 newtons and The platform itself weighed something, right? I think 200 newtons. Uh, the force for something nice and uniform density, we always put the force representing its weight at its center of gravity, which for something as uniform density and nice uh, symmetric shape is just right down the center. Then we had, uh, I had, believe we had a, a cable attaching it to the roof with an angle of 53 degrees. So is that the problem as, as we set it up? But we did nothing more with it than that? We had that much, but didn't actually quite get to solve it, get to solving it. Is that true? John? We start. We started. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is not the free body diagram. Why not? It's not free. It's it's the object we want to keep in equilibrium, which is the platform, is not free of some of the other things in the problem. It's still got the cables drawn there. It's still got the the wall support there. So we uh, free it up of everything else. We've already got a couple forces on there, so we'll go ahead and put those in. I think we knew the weight to be 200 newtons. You just look at that. 
and you know it's not going to be in equilibrium. So you know you're not done. That's not always the case. There's sometimes a, a picture can kind of look like it could be in equilibrium, so you got to think about those ones. But this one's so obviously not in equilibrium. There's got to be something else going on. There's two forces going down, no forces going up. So what did we have that was going up? A wire. Well, we have the wire there, and wires only pull, and they only pull along their own length. So we know that to be 53 degrees, but we don't know what the tension is. In fact, I think we're supposed to find that. You've got to know what that tension is going to be so you can get down to the store and buy a good enough cable that will hold it. Still, it doesn't look like this is an equilibrium because we could have some torques pulling that way. In fact, all the torques could, could cause it to go counterclockwise about a particular point. If we pick a point right there, every one of those forces is trying to turn that thing counterclockwise around that point. We don't want any sum of the torques. We don't want any angular acceleration anywhere, much less at that one point. So you know you're still not done. There's got to be some other forces. And what else did we come up with? Force of the reaction force. What we call the reaction force, the force exerted by the support over here. We call that reaction forces. Did I draw it in actually? Yeah. Yeah, yeah see we don't know what direction it's going to be. So what we typically do is just make the simple move of uh, already breaking it into X and Y components. Um, sometimes you just have to guess which direction it's going to be. Um, seems pretty obvious that that thing's got to hold that end from falling down, so it better have a, a force up. So might want to call that RY. Is that what I called it last Wednesday, just so I don't yeah. switch things up? Yeah, it makes, it's the reaction in the y direction. That's all we're saying. And then you can look at this. You see the tension's trying to pull it to the left. So the reaction has got to work against that. We've got to have some x reaction against the tension. Otherwise, it's going to go left. Now it's starting to look like we might have the possibility of, of getting this thing into equilibrium. Um, uh, you're starting to think, Maybe we've got all the forces. Sooner or later you do. You can't just add them forever. But do we have all the forces? Remember the rule. Any force you put up on a free body diagram, what's the rule about it? Any force, whether it's in this part of the class where these things always sum to zero, or the earlier part of the class where we let things accelerate, what had to be true about any force that went on a free body diagram? Has to be caused by something real, something that I can go point to, I can put my hand on, I can hold, give it a hug. It's got to be something real. So you can't say oh, that force is caused by the motion. I can't. You can't touch motion. You can see it, but it's not real enough for you to go touch. That's the rule with the forces. So, any others? No. If there is, there's got to be something in the problem that causes it, and we pretty much have everything in here. So then, we sum the forces. Uh, how many unknowns? I heard three. Three. Doesn't hurt to count them up. Make sure you know what you what you're looking for. Uh, in a problem, we may not be asked to find all the unknowns, but that doesn't mean they aren't counting as unknowns because they still affect all the equations. So all three of those things are unknown. Remember that the, the knowing the components of any force is the same as knowing its magnitude and direction. Either way, that's two unknowns. Either the two components are unknown, or the direction and the magnitude is unknown, but still two things unknown. All right, so 
sum the forces in the x direction, we know those forces should sum to zero. Just to make the algebra easier, I think it's wise to look at that fact as also saying all left-facing forces equal all right-facing forces. When you write it up that way, there's no minus signs, you don't get confused, you just look at your picture and you write it up that way. All the left forcing, all the left facing things equal all the right facing things. So, uh, we've got Rx pointing in one direction. What's pointing in the opposite direction to balance it? T in the x direction. Or, to keep it simple, T cosine 53. You want to try to set up these equations so no more unknowns come into it. Every time a new unknown comes in, besides one of these three, you need another equation for it. Sum the forces in the y direction. That must also sum to zero. So every up force must have a down force to beat it. So you write it out. You write out the sum of the forces in the y direction. See if we get the same thing. You can use the symbols if you want or you can use the numbers if we have them. Watch your units. Not too big a deal on this one, but it could be on other ones. Don't show me. Show, show Andrew. He's working with you. We're doing the same problem. Your algebra might be a little bit different. You may have just laid them out in a slightly different order. But just look at the diagram. All the up ones have got to equal all the down ones. Do you guys agree? Did you agree? Not yet. But you're going to soon? Soon, yes. I think they'll be able to work it out, though. We're in the last week of the term. About time to start working at Wendy's again. Love that summer job. You can see guys will come over at Wendy's. Oh, you want to drive that one? I'm going to throw something. I'm going to have to pour it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. guys do it on bicycles. I heard that one drives in a place called the police on them. I'd say fine, I'll serve you. You got the money, I'll serve you. I don't care. I didn't see what I did. I didn't see what I did. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. We should be partners. <laughs> Alan, would you agree with anybody? <laughs> Boycotting? No, I'm just, I just wrote. Yeah. 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 All right, let's see. What do we have pointing up? Uh, of course, RY is pointing up. Anything else pointing up? Yeah, of course, the, we got the little piece of T there, which would be T sine theta is pointing up. T sine 53 is also an up force. You don't have to do it this way, and I won't grade it wrong if you, if you don't do it this way, but it's the way I found over the years just to make things the most simple. All the up forces equal all the down ones, no minus signs. It's hard, it's uh, more difficult to to miss any of these when you do it that way. Um, that's all the up ones, all the down ones. We got the 600 and the 200. Is that it? So that's, that's all three unknowns, but only two equations. So we can't solve it yet. I can. You can. And Superman can. Got him. What? Got him. I'd like to see that. 
So we use our one other equation where the sum of the torques equal to zero. This one's a little bit trickier. Uh, well, not trickier. I guess it is. It, 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 this is where students will, will screw up a little bit more than others because this stuff, this stuff we we did we started this months ago when we were doing particle motion. It's this that's new in the last couple weeks. Uh, torques are always forces operating some distance from a central point. What central point? The hinge? What? It's the, middle where the, weight is. the middle where the weight is? Wishy washy answer. What? <laughs> Even wishy washier. It's our chair. You need one third You guys are right. We don't want this thing to have angular acceleration in any way. We don't want it to turn about any point. Doesn't matter what point. We can look at any point we want. We don't want it to have any angular acceleration about that point. So calculate your torques about any point you want, and you'll do fine. You'll get the right answer as long as you set it up right. However, there are easier points to pick than others that just make the mathematics, the algebra, because we've got to solve these three you're going to have a system of three equations. The easier you can make it, the better, the less likely you are to scrooge it up. How do you pick a good point? We have a couple possibilities. Let's see. Let's label that one A. That was the hinge. You said that. Uh, Joy or, or Bill said the weight. Do it about the center. So we'll call that point B. Here's a point over here, point C. Any other point you want to pick is is, is fair game because we don't want accel angular acceleration of any part of this thing anywhere. Which, how do we choose one of those points or some other point that might make things a little bit easier? Already got a hinge on what do you look for? Huh? It's already got a hinge on it. No, well, yeah, I'm not going to put another hinge on it. That doesn't answer my question. It's not a, a, a necessarily obvious to me. What? You, that's not the thing you look for. You don't look for the place you're going to go and get a drill out and put some screws in the wall. What you look at is this drawing and you pick a place that gives you a simpler solution. Simpler solution means less chance of error. What do you look for? Remember, torque is force applied at some distance from a central point, some distance that's perpendicular to that force. So any point that has forces going through it, that force doesn't exert any moment, any, any torque there, because it's going right through that point. Remember, that's how we set up torque in the very first place. I said we have some object here and some point there. If the force goes right through a point, it doesn't exert any torque. So pick the point, if there is one, where more forces go through that point than any other, they exert no torque, they're not going to be in the equation. It's just simpler. We'll set up a couple just to illustrate it so, so we can all see what I mean. Let's see. Let's let's do a couple examples. We'll take the easiest one and then we'll write it in down there. So, summing the torques with respect to point A. Generally, too, I advise you start at one end of the object and go to the other end so you don't miss any forces. You've got to look at every single one of them. How much torque does Rx exert with respect to point A. Huh? None. Why none? none it goes right through point A. So Rx can't exert any torque. It's not going to cause the object to twist about point A 
because it goes right through point A. So Rx isn't in this equation. Step across the thing, go to the next one. Ry, how much torque does it exert about point A? Y0 goes right through that point. 600, does it exert any tor torque about point A? It does, because it's, it's trying to twist A around it. Uh, so how much torque does that force 600 newtons cause? What's its moment arm? Two meters. Yeah, the moment arm, remember, is the perpendicular distance from the force to the point we're interested in. Not just any distance, the perpendicular distance. And if you need to, you can imagine that the force has a line of action. It's the shortest distance from that line of action to the point, which in this case would be uh, two meters. In which direction is the torque being caused by that 600 newtons? Down. Not down. Down's not the right answer for torque. Clockwise. 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 If you're pinned here at point A, that force is going to try to make things go that way. We're going to stop it somehow, but that's what it would tend to do. So this will be uh, all the clockwise torques on this side. Because remember, we want to make all the clockwise torques equal all the counterclockwise torques. Uh, the 200, does it cause torque? Yes or no? Yes. yes. What's its What's the size of the torque the 200 causes? Force times moment arm. The moment arm here again is the perpendicular distance out to the line of the force. That's 4 meters, so this is 2. 200 times 4 meters, and in what direction? It's pulling down, point A is over here, it's also going to try to turn the object that way. We're going to stop it, but it is also a clockwise torque. 200 newtons at a moment arm, a perpendicular distance of 4 meters. All right, keep on down. We, just, we don't want to miss any of these. Uh, we get down here, we have this force. Is it causing a torque? Yeah, part of it. Part of it? What do you mean part of it? Part of it acts like that. Uh, not TY. TX. Uh, that's what we had right here. We've already used it. And part of it's acting like that. That'll be TY. That's what we have right here. We've got to look at both of those to see if they cause any torque. You know by now, we're at the last available force in this problem. We need some, we need some counterclockwise torque because we've only had clockwise torque so far. So you've got to be expecting to have some counterclockwise torque coming up here. How much torque is caused by Tx? What do you mean none? It's way down here. It's all the way at the end of the beam. It still points directly through point A. So it's moment arm, it's perpendicular distance between the line of that force and the point is zero. Tx causes no torque. What about TY? It's got that little perpendicular distance to all the way down to A. So we know that, that uh, TY, which is T sine 30, uh, sorry, 53, what's its moment arm? 
it's the full 8 meters. Its perpendicular distance back to point A is a full 8 meters. And it's trying to turn things counterclockwise. All the clockwise torques got to equal all the counterclockwise torques. If not, there's going to be some left over and it's going to start spinning in that direction. Which we don't want it to do. We want this to be in equilibrium. How many unknowns in that equation? One. Just one. That's as simple as these can be. If we do the moment about any other point, we're going to have more unknowns. It's just a little bit more difficult to solve. Just the algebra is a little more difficult. If we sum the torques about point B, notice W causes no torque, but now RY does and TY does. So you have two unknowns in the one equation. It's just a little bit more difficult to set up. If we did it about point C, with if we sum the torques about point C, how many unknowns would there be in the equation? If we sum about, let's see, let's put that in here. If we do it about B, there'll be two unknowns in the equation, um, Ry and Ty. Even if we use Ty in that form, T is still unknown. Sum the torques about C. How many unknowns would there be if we did that? I hear one. What is it? If we sum the torques about C, Ty goes through it, Tx goes through it, Rx goes through it, but Ry doesn't. So we have Ry as the only unknown here. None of those three will be wrong. It's just some are easier than others. The A and the C equation, just a little bit easier, that's all. Especially if the problem asks you for the tension, but doesn't ask you for the hinge forces. This equation will give you the tension, and you forget about the hinge forces if it doesn't ask for them. Because this one will give you the hinge forces, but then you can use it to solve for the tension. Just more steps. More steps, more chance to screw you up. So that will be three equations and three unknowns, whichever one you choose. Whether it's A or C, it doesn't really matter. After that, once you get all three of those set up, it's just algebra. It's left to you to, to get the algebra right. Which of course you would, wouldn't you? Did anybody do this problem? Get some numbers? Yeah, 313. Right. The tension is 313. So you can do these and double check this. And the reaction, there's two components to it, X and Y. 188I plus 250. Really? I have 550 written down. But yeah, we can, that's that's the Y component. I may have just written it down. We have oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to subtract it from the 800. Ah, I win. So you can you can check those numbers. Any questions about that?
careful with the algebra. It's easy to screw up. You don't want to lose the points there in a physics class. Well, let's look at uh, maybe a, a homework problem or two that were assigned. No, you know what? Let's let's do some others because the homework ones I'll post. You can just go look at those. So let's do another another problem. Here's a suspension of a traffic signal. Let's see. Uh, red, yellow, and green. It's pretty green, isn't it? I didn't bring that green. Oh, I, wait, wait, I know what to do. Blue, yeah. That looks kind of green now, doesn't it? Well, shut up. Join me nuts. Maybe it's lying closer together. Huh? There you go. Is that kind of greeny? Good back right there. There we go. It doesn't matter. You guys just think everything's a green light anyway. Yellow, and that means greener, hit the gas. Red means only suckers stop. You figure that at least half the population is older than you are and more mature, that at least half the population will stop the new light so you don't need to. It's pretty good chances, I guess. So. 30 kilograms, 45 degree angle there, and 37 degrees here. Presumably, you want that light to remain in equilibrium. You don't want it to accelerate. Not when you're under it. If we don't want it to accelerate, we know then the forces must sum to zero and any torques. We're only doing 2D problems, so we can skip the sign. To do these, the best thing I recommend is a free body diagram. Of what? A what? A what? No, free body diagram of an object. The street light. Let's try that. So here's the street light. You draw any forces on it. Look at your picture and tell whether or not that is good and big, you know. You can look at your picture and tell whether or not you've got a complete three body diagram because otherwise it'll accelerate so quick you gotta get all the forces on the page. Got it? How many forces on it? Three? Name one. Okay, give me one. The weight. The force of gravity acting on it. Straight down. Uh, do you have that number? Or is that an unknown? Yeah. 294. 
Yeah, we don't have it, but we've got the mass, so don't consider that an unknown. Just do W equals mg, and don't don't uh, fiddle around making too many of my unknowns. Uh, there's got to be some upward force, or that thing's going to accelerate downward. We got to hurry. The highway department wants it left where it is. Joe, another force. Thirty-seven degree wire. Thirty-seven degree wire. So, like that. Is that thirty-seven degrees? That angle? Yes. yes. What's that force's name? Name it after Joe. You might want to just name them T1 and T2. Keep it simple, but keep it helpful. You look at that, you know that at the moment it's going to take off to the right. So there must be something to the left. And of course that's the tension in the other line. That has the possibility of being in equilibrium. How many unknowns? Two. two unknowns. T1 and T2, how many equations do you need then? Of course, it's two. Which two equations? Just those two? do when you have two unknowns, three equations? You save the extra equation for the next problem. Carry it over. Sometimes you can write it on a little piece of paper and put it in your wallet. They pull it out for the final. It might, you know, like a, like a monopoly free equation card. Substitute. Grant the bearer one free equation of his choice. What do you do when you have fewer unknowns than available equations? Write out the equation and see what you have. What it usually means is you don't need all the equations. That's all. You can solve the problem with two equations. You only need as many equations as there are unknowns, even if there are more equations. So, is this going to be a useful equation? Yeah. Sure, we got, uh, uh, well, you write it out. Is it going to be useful to solve some of the forces in the y direction? It's useful as long as it, those two equations are independent, which they always are. The x equation is always independent of the y equation for the forces. And as long as it doesn't introduce any more unknowns. So you write out that equation see if we get it laid out in the same form with the same unknowns, same minus signs, plus signs, and equal signs. It's kind of a green tent. You had a green tent. You, you need yellow. Is that yellow? Finish your drawing. Yeah. Come on here, Joe. Show some artistic flair. Oh, that looks good. Oh, yeah. That makes me want to hit the brakes. Right there. I'm ready to stop. Put on the brakes.
Got it? Who'd you check with? Nobody. You're not on speaking terms with anybody. They don't even recognize you're not here half the time. It's Andrew, by the way, everybody. Introduce yourself. Make them feel welcome here in the last week. Everybody got an X equation? If you do, go on to the Y equation. We need them both. Well, we hope that's all we need. We only need two equations. <coughs> hope it's these two. They're our favorites. Andrew, you were done first. What's your x direction equation look like? Read it to me. Uh, sum of the force in the x direction is tension to sine 45. Plus wait, wait, slow down. T2 sine 45. Oh, yeah, cos. Yeah, now cosine and sine 45 are the same anyway. So numerically, you would have come out, but if you ever went back and changed the angles, you know, as you're going to do as engineers redesign things, but didn't change the equation, you'd get caught. So keep it, keep it the same, even though cosine and sine are the same. And then what? Because uh, that's a left going force, so the right going force is? Yeah, T1 cos 37. Anybody have anything other than that for the x-direction equation? If you want to, feel free to say this minus that equals zero, but algebraically it's the same thing. This way there's no minus signs. Generally, it, uh, I found students have less trouble skipping any. Sum the forces in the y-direction. Samantha, you have that? Um, I have the weight. Okay. Equals like T1 in the y direction, T2 in the y direction. All right. But if you write T1Y and T2Y, it looks like you've introduced more unknowns. If we write it that way, then we're already okay. So that would just be the sign of those two. But you can make that step independently if you want. It's not incorrect. Is that sufficient to solve that problem? Yes. Not yet. Well, you have to do algebra. So the system is sufficient. Yes. Why don't we need the torque equation? I mean, yeah, we don't need it, but is there a physical reason we don't need it? This is a physics class, not an algebra class. No, Thank all the God. Pass through the, the center point, the the center point. All of these forces pass through a single point. Doesn't matter where it is. Anywhere, there's a, if there's a single point, all forces pass through it. There's no torque exerted at all. If you did the torque equation, all you're going to get is the very helpful solution that zero equals zero. Because all the counterclockwise torques are zero, all the clockwise ones are zero. So zero equals zero. It's, it's comforting to know that that's still true. It hasn't changed over the weekend. Lots of things did, especially last night. Everybody got that news? Yeah. 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 Not me, I slept through it. Um, so we don't always need all the equations, but that doesn't mean this doesn't apply. It doesn't it's just it has a trivial solution. Joe, would it be the same if the tensions are going to the corners of the of the light, right? Like it's over that point. Oh, that's how you do it. I don't know if that like this, if the if the cables were actually over there. You tell me. I say yes. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. um. Now, you can't necessarily tell from your drawing because 
for the drawing to actually tell you, you'd need to know, you need to measure those angles and draw everything just right. And, uh, that's a little difficult to do it, but in general, yeah, it's not going to make any difference. What if... Uh, What if that was hanging down on its own line? Now what do you do the free body diagram of? Just got no Huh? What should you do the free body diagram of now? Because doing it of the light is not going to show those two lines because they don't touch the light. They don't exert any force on the light. The three lines. Nothing can accelerate in this problem. So why not do a free body diagram of the knot? I guess it's not a knot with cable. But the, the place where those all three come together will still have the same general diagram. And you still sum the forces in the x and y direction, get the same, same deal. It was uh, maybe a get out of class question. Hey, good girl. What do you, Joey, what do you say? Uh, you want a big X on your nice blue shirt? What do you say? <laughs> you do? You go ahead with the X? What do you say, Mike? Make it a good one. Why wouldn't I make it a good one? All right. Imagine the uh, the human arm holding something there. We'll make it my arm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh wait. Yeah, you are sure, of course. Yeah, you, you know, I, I don't come to class in sleeveless shirts. That's why I, they, they said stop showing your your intimidating tattoos. Would be intimidating, wouldn't it? So there you go. So we'll model this as as a, a simple set of forces where. Uh, we have a, a, the elbow there about which everything pivots. There's this muscle and tendon that pull up in that direction. We'll also say that whatever this weight is here, we'll call that six kilograms. And let's say the forearm itself weighs one kilogram. And just to put some approximate dimensions to this business, we'll call the distance that, that your bicep comes down and attaches to the front of the, the, the forearm there. To, that's what pulls up this forearm, is when this force pulls up this thing because of unbalanced torques. That's what God was thinking when he did it. We'll make that 3.4 centimeters and the whole distance out to there 30 centimeters. Alright. I want you to find find the force exerted by the muscle to hold steady in equilibrium. Forearm essentially horizontal. Let that force there be vertical. Make it a little bit simpler. And uh, also find find the forces in the elbow. 
which we call fell. Fell? Fell. Forces in the elbow. All right, let me make sure I gave you everything. All right. Again, make the muscle force vertical. Just to keep it simple. It's a little bit of an angle there, but don't uh, don't mess with that. And then uh, get a, a, a quick approximation of the force in the muscle and the force in the elbow. You get that right, go early. Go home and study earlier. Study longer. Study harder. So instead of getting to bed at uh, 2.30, you can get to bed at 2.20 this morning. Oh, and you guys that uh, only have two hours, if you want to, you can come earlier and get started at 8. You, I don't think you'll need it. I hope you won't need it. I, I try not to make a test that goes anywhere near the three hours, but just to be fair. So like you, who else has to leave early? You, Mike does. Well, you're, but your assistant, you, you need to use Mountain for? I don't know if here last night. Okay. So, Mike, John, if you want to come earlier, you have to find me. All the, the, my class in here will be taking an exam at the same time, so I'll just be around. Just call me and let me know you're ready. Okay. It should, like I said, it shouldn't take you that long, but just in case. But it would give us a few times. That's terrible. Reduce the pressure for both tests. Do better. Model the forearm just as a, a simple thing like that with some forces on it. What's that? F? Elbow? Elbow. Elbow. The forces in the elbow. Oh, the forces. It's possible that you're lifting enough weight you can bust your elbow, blow your elbow apart. Nothing cooler than watching those weight guys kill themselves. Trying to impress the girls across the across the gym. Len, we ought to pull up that one picture of that uh, was that USC football player that dropped that barbell on his neck? Oh yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, that was. Uh, that was the day for the Olympics. Uh, he was doing like a clean press or whatever, and like his arms were always had and basically his arms collapsed. Oh no, that other one too, the guy was, no, I was talking about the guy was bench pressing. Yeah. And it oh, slips and drops on his neck. That guy. Yeah. No, we're always looking for Darwin to take out one more football player for us, but not this one. Persistent bastard. <laughs> <laughs> See, even if he did live, he should say, well, God didn't want me to live, so I better not have children. So make that free body diagram. How is this different from the problem we had with the uh, with the platform? The elbow is free. Of it is, it's not terribly different. Um, what forces do you have on it? It's weight. It's weight, which is the fact that it has a kilogram mass. So the arm weighs a little bit of something, call that warm, or W arm. What else? Weight of the ball. Weight of the ball. A little bit bigger, because there's six kilograms there, but that's just mg. Quick, what else? There's got to be some forces up. Yeah, the muscle's pulling up, and we're going to model that as vertical. 3.4 centimeters out here. We're looking for that one. What else? 
See, right now, that doesn't look, well, it could be an equilibrium, because those are pulling down, that one's pulling up. If we did it about here, those pull clockwise, that pulls counterclockwise, we might be okay. What other forces? Force the elbow. need something to fix the... What? Elbow. Yeah. Yeah, fix it to the position. Well, the, we could use uh, some x direction. This we'll call it L, I mean in the y direction. That's Felby. And there might be an X component. Who wants to calculate the size of the X component here? What is it? Zero. Why is it zero? Goes right through the point. Nope. Because you need to keep going off the cell that's going to stay fixed. There aren't any other forces available to counteract this one. It's got to be zero. First, you have to make sure there aren't any other forces. That one's got to be zero. Now what? Well, you can sum the forces in the y direction. That's certainly possible. We already did it in the x direction. That's how we got that to be zero. Sum the forces in the y direction. We don't even need to call it elbow y. That's the only part there is. Those two up. Those two down. How many unknowns? Two. Sum the torques about which point? Sum the torques about three. Sum the torques about which point? Oh, well, let's make it the elbow. Uh, any point's okay. If you make it the elbow, then that force isn't in the equation because it goes right through the point. If you make it here, that force isn't in the equation because it goes through the point. So just for the last little thing to illustrate, I'm going to put it there. Does anybody see problem? Huh? You can find an FM, so then you don't. Yeah, but you you can find elbow here and just go back and find FM there. What? There's some problem here. You don't know where the weight of the arm is. No, we'll take the weight of the arm in the center. That's fine. Just we'll just put it in the middle of that 30 centimeters. Good enough. Remember, it's just an approximation here. You're gonna have two on now. You do it that doesn't way. matter if we have two unknowns. Why are there two unknowns? If we do it through point A, FM is not in the equation. That's the only unknown that will be in the equation. That's the only one exerting torque. Either way. But if we do it about point A, does anybody see a problem? They're all the same direction. About point A, that's doing a clockwise torque. This is doing a clockwise torque. What's this one doing? Clockwise. A clockwise torque. What's wrong? Your elbow can't. Huh? The elbow cannot. Go. That. I just drew that in the wrong direction. It was just a guess. I'm not sure which direction. Now I know it should be down. You know, a little bit more. It's got to be down to counteract the torque of the other two, and you can then finish the problem. Just so you have them. This force is 494. And the muscle force is 563. So you can check those, make sure you get them.
Uh, by the way, this is actually down, not up. If you ever pick the wrong direction and you solve the problem, you get a negative number, it just tells you you did it in the wrong direction. Nothing more than that. Yeah. If, or you can just leave it like that and you'll get a negative number and you say it's it's up in the opposite direction. Yeah, I'll go do it right now so I don't forget it. 